Hi there, folks, and good afternoon. Thanks for those joining us live. Hello. Um, thank you so much. We're glad to have you tuning in to today's event to learn all about Central Oregon trees. I have a hard time keeping some trees straight myself, so I'm looking forward to joining you and learning today. Um, my name is Rebecca Ratcliffe. I am the Outreach Associate for the Deschutes Land Trust. And I'll be doing my best to facilitate our event today. So as a reminder, our presenter will be the only one with a mic on during this time. So help us hear her more clearly and um, keep the rest of us focusing on listening. We will be sharing additional information uh, and resources in a follow-up email. So don't fret if you miss an interesting tidbit or need more pictures of a certain tree. We'll be able to share more resources following the event. For those of you who are not yet familiar, the Deschutes Land Trust is a conservation organization local to Bend, Oregon. We protect and care for over 17,000 acres of critical wildlife habitat, incredible streams, and just some stunning natural beauty in this area. If you haven't been able to visit, I hope you can soon. As we continue to adapt our in-person walks and hikes with the changing COVID conditions, we are going to continue offering these virtual events to bring just a little bit of nature um, inside and home to you, unless you're outside, streaming outside. Um, if you're enjoying this virtual content, like today's talk or some of the talks coming up, I hope that you'll consider making a small donation to the Land Trust. Your support really helps us conserve and protect the nature of Central Oregon. And I will be posting the donation link um, in the chat and the comments. Uh, your donation will really help us protect some of the places that these trees need as well. So thank you in advance. Then keep an eye out because our in-person walks and hikes are coming up. So keep an eye out to sign up for some of those as they come so you can get out to see some of these trees up close and personally. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter. Chelsea is a co-founder and educator at Nighthawk Naturalist School. She has spent her adult life teaching and learning in many fields of environmental work, including stream ecology, wildlife monitoring, migratory bird banding, invasive plant removal, backcountry trips, wildlife and survival, wilderness survival skills, all kinds of fun stuff. Hopefully she'll be able to share a bit about. Um, she loves the complexity of natural studies and um, knows that when you get to keep learning, um, you just get to keep learning all the rest of your life because you never know all the things about the natural world. Um, she has a special fondness for plants, their roles in ecosystems and how humans have interacted with them throughout all of human history. Uh, and I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit more about that while we talk about trees. So welcome, Chelsea. Thanks for being here and I'll let you uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so I first, I guess, entered my botanical and ethnobotany journey when I was in college. Um, I went to school in North Carolina and I studied environmental biology and it was sort of there that I was introduced to, um, I guess, the depth and complexity complexity of ecosystems. Um, and then when I moved out to central Washington um, several years ago, I, uh, I was introduced to the coniferous forest. So I moved from this hardwood landscape um, of the East Coast, and then I moved to Washington where it was completely different. And ever since then, I've been teaching and learning, um, teaching wilderness skills and environmental education to people of all ages and sort of continuing my own learning journey. Um, and so I'm always learning <laughs> and I'm excited to share some of that with you all today. So when I moved to Central Oregon, one of the first things that I noticed was this wonderful ecotone that exists. Um, as you move from west to east across the landscape or east to west. Um, so in Deschutes County, we have the mountains, the wonderful mountains on the west side um, that have that beautiful ponderosa and other pine forest. And then of course you have the sagebrush way east. Um, and so today we're gonna talk about the trees of those landscapes. And so we're gonna start kind of in town in the Bend area with some of the trees that we find 
in town and then we'll move out to the wilderness, see some trees of the riparian landscapes and up into the mountains into those higher elevations. Um, so here we go. Let's see. Hmm. The slide ticker is not really working very well. There we go. All right. So we're going to start with the wonderful Western Juniper. So this is one that so many people in Deschutes County know so well already. Many people know of it because they have terrible allergies when they're around them. Um, people also know it uh, kind of as somewhat of a pest tree of the area. Um, it has these really expansive root systems um, that tap down into that water table and they really suck all the water up. So people um, are sometimes a little bit confounded by the juniper, but um, they are a beautiful tree and we do have some of the oldest junipers in the world, um, a little bit east of Bend in the Badlands. Um, so they're kind of characterized by this beautiful stripy bark you can see, um, really shreddy bark. As far as ethnobotanical purposes, the bark is really great um, for tinder bundles for starting fires. Um, they're also home to a lot of wildlife. So this is a little picture of a pygmy nuthatch that's popping out of the trunk of a juniper tree near my house. but. Um, they're also hosts to, like you can see in that first picture, some beautiful bright green wolf lichen that's growing on those branches. And you can kind of see that from really far away and that bright, bright green that's the juniper is often host to. Um, also, when you're walking through those sagebrush steps, you can see uh, there's a little creature that's called a wood rat that likes to take up residence in the base of the tree. So they'll pile a bunch of sticks and juniper leaves and other dry dead things that are on the ground and pile up these huge nests. Um, and so if you see that in the base of a juniper tree in the sagebrush landscape, it's probably a wood rat. They're similar to a, what you would think of as a house rat or a Norway rat, but they have a really bushy tail. Um, they love making homes in juniper trees. Um, here's a great photo of another distinguishing feature of the juniper, those berries, which are actually the female cones of the juniper tree. Um, you can kind of see the white film that's over the top of the berries. Um, you'll see that a lot on junipers. Um, sometimes recently I've been seeing that darker color in the junipers, juniper berries as they're just maturing, but that white is actually a natural yeast layer that's on top of the junipers. Um, all right, so moving on to the next tree that I'm sure you've seen around town if you've been in Bend, but it's prevalent across kind of a variety of landscapes around here, the ponderosa. So the ponderosa pine, um, this picture is really great <laughs> because it's that red, red color is what I noticed first when I see those trees. And it's a real great identifier for the tree. The bright reddish orange color and that dark, dark furrowed uh, bark. So the little lines and furrows in the tree are a little bit darker than the bark on the outside. Um, also a notable feature about the juniper when you're walking through the forest in the summertime and you take a deep breath in is that beautiful vanilla -y scent you get um, when you're walking around. And that's that uh, ponderosa sap that's heating up in the sunlight, um, warm vanilla -y smell. Um, so here's a great shot of those pollen cones. Pollen cones pretty shortly here in central Oregon We'll start seeing the little pollen layer on our cars from these ponderosa trees. Um, it's also uh, a really high protein nutrient actually in survival situations, pine pollen. Uh, so also a really useful plant. Um, another distinguishing feature that I'll talk about with this tree, but also with a lot of the pines um, is that you can identify which pine it is by how many little needles are in the bundle. So pine trees, of course, have needle-like leaves. And if you were to look at one of these individual bundles and count the number of needles, you would find three in each one. And that is specific to ponderosas. Um, and it's a good way to tell it apart really from other 
other pines that are nearby in the area that I will talk about in a little bit. Here's a great shot of um, one of those ponderosa cones. Um, if you're kind of unsure of what pine tree you're looking at from looking up, you can always look down on the ground. And if you see these uh, spiky little crunchy ponderosa cones, then you might be near a ponderosa. Um, they're notable because they're red like the bark, but also have these little spikes on the outside of the scales sticking out. And also, I think they have the best crunch to them of all the pine cones when you step on them when you're walking through the forest. <laughs> Identify by sound. <laughs> all right, here's another pine. Excuse me, just a sec. So this is the lodgepole pine. And you can already tell a difference between this pine and the ponderosa by its cone. So. Its cone is much smaller overall, um, and the cones are pretty prolific on the plant. So there are quite a lot of them. If you look up into a lodgepole and see tons and tons of little cones, um, that's a good identifying feature. Also, as you can see in this photo, uh, those needles that I was talking about, the little bundles of them, lodgepole has two bundles or two needles in each bundle, sorry. Um, and I like to remember that because lodge pole has two syllables and they also have two needles per bundle. Um, so that's just a mnemonic device to help me remember the lodge pole. Um, you might have seen something like this on a pine tree when uh, you've been walking around central Oregon. So lodge poles specifically in this area are kind of susceptible to a blight. Um, the mountain pine beetle tends to attack these trees. And one of the responses of the tree is to try to protect itself by exuding sap. Um, so sometimes if you see a tree completely covered in sap, it means it might be dealing with some sort of either fungal or beetle disease. Um, another fungal organism that sometimes attacks pines in this area is called the gall rust. And when it's when that is attacking the tree, you will see these big swollen parts of the limbs um, when you look at the branches. Um, and that is the gall part of the fungal rust. Um, this one is actually in my yard. I just had a lodge pole removed because it was completely killed by beetles. Um, so this is next door. But Ah, so I mentioned that Lodgepole is in town, um, but it's also pretty high up in the mountains. So all of these in this photo, all of these smaller trees that are maybe 15 or so years old that are coming in um, from a big burn in the area of Three Finger Jack is the mountain you can see in the background. Um, these are mostly Lodgepole. Um, so Lodgepole can grow at mid elevations and it also can grow at higher up uh, elevation. So you'll see it even pretty high up on the volcanoes around here, like south, the hike on South Sister, you can see them pretty high up. Um, so it's a pretty diverse uh, species as far as ecosystems it habitates. This one is not a local native tree, but you will see it specifically in Bend, or you'll see it sometimes on farms or in riparian corridors. Um, this is the Siberian elm, and so unlike the slippery elm or the American elm, it is not from the United States, but it has taken up residence all across the U.S. Um, farmland, especially in drier areas, people plant them as shade trees because they're super hardy, but they also suck up a lot of water and they um, can tend to uh, get tangled up, the roots get tangled up into plumbing systems. So um, they're not super well loved, but you will see them around town quite a lot. Um, this one is in my neighborhood. Um, this is what they look like now, but in a few weeks, even some of them around town are already um, getting their flowers and their seeds. So their seeds are adapted to wind. As you can see, they're like big round petals and they float really easily on the wind and the birds love them. So those are some cedar wax wings in there munching on seeds. 
you can also see that their leaves are um, pretty different. They're serrated, they have deep veins, um, they're really pale green color. Um, the twigs themselves, um, often deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves in the winter, um, you will be identifying trees by their twigs instead of their leaves. So these twigs, um, it's a little bit hard to tell in this photo, but they have a kind of zigzag pattern. Um, so kind of at these little leaf buds here, the branch will twist one way and then the other at the next. So they have kind of a zigzaggy stem. And as the name indicates, they are native to Siberia, Central Asia, and parts of Russia. Oh, here's that deeply furrowed bark of the Siberian elm, kind of deep twisty bark. All right, now we're moving into the more wild landscapes, uh, the riparian corridors and the mountain areas of central Oregon. This is one of my favorites, is the quaking aspen. And they're known for beautiful fall colors. Um, that's one thing they're really well known for. They're also really well known for having really stark white bark. Um, and they have these kind of eye-like structures on the trunk that are where a limb once was, but has since fallen. And they're kind of distinct eye-like features that some people um, take note of because they're really obvious when you're looking and you have all these eyes staring at you at face level. Um, also, the bark is really white. And if you were to go up and touch the trunk of an aspen tree, um, you would look at your hand and you would have white powder on it. Um, that is important to the tree because it's sort of a defense mechanism against fire, but it's also um, historically traditionally used as sunscreen. If you put a little bit of that white on your skin, it's said to be protective against the sun, which is perhaps how the tree uses it at what, as well in some way. One of the awesome things about quaking aspen is that the leaves quake in the wind. Um, if you're in an aspen grove in summertime and the wind's blowing through the trees, it makes a beautiful sound, but the leaves also gently wiggle. Um, and actually the leaf shape has a lot to do with that, that wiggle. Um, you can see it a little bit better in this photo, but the petiole of the aspen leaf, which is this little structure that connects the leaf to the stem, is very flat and it connects to the leaf at a 90 degree angle. So that sort of facilitates when the wind blows through it, it makes those leaves tremble and quake. Um, so that's kind of the mechanism that allows that to happen. That's pretty unique to that specific tree. Um, Aspens are also a colony plant. So one of the largest organisms in the world is actually an aspen grove. And it's said to be the largest organism in the world because aspens will clone themselves. Um, they'll send out little shoots along the ground from their root system that are all identical replicas of the mother, um, the original plant. And so you can have several square miles of plant that are all actually from the same organism. And so this is an example of one of those. This is actually a little bit south and east of here in the Steens Mountain area. Another fun fact about Aspen, because I love them so much, <laughs> uh, is they're like beaver candy. So um, beavers love Aspen. It's one of their favorite trees. Um, if you see an Aspen grove, likely near water. And if it is near water, then there's probably beaver sign somewhere in there. So this is classic beaver sign. Uh, you can see those little incisor marks in there. And you can also tell it's a beaver because the branches nod away at almost exactly a 45 degree angle. And so anytime you're walking through an aspen grove and you see all the branches lopped off at exactly a 45 degree angle, probably a beaver did it. All right, another poplar. So uh, the black cottonwood tree and the aspen are in the same genus, they're poplar, 
popular, popular genus species, um, but they're a little bit different. They both love wet areas, uh, but as you can tell from this photo, um, the bark is pretty different. So cottonwood bark is gray. Uh, it's not white like those aspens and it's not smooth like the aspens. It's quite furrowed. Um, and the leaf is also more of a teardroppy shape, although it does also have wonderful color in the fall. Uh, they also put out these really lovely resiny, sticky resiny buds, leaf buds in the uh, late winter and early spring. Um, so cottonwood buds, smell wonderful. <laughs> if you pick them up, they'll leave a sticky goo on your hands, but they uh, smell lovely. Also, you can tell on these little twigs here. Cottonwood twigs are notable because they have what people call knuckles on them. They have these big bumps, kind of like wrinkles in the twig that go up and down. And that's pretty um, specific to cottonwoods and cottonwood-like trees. Here's another great shot of those buds. All right, sticking in the theme of the riparian wet areas. Uh, this is a willow plant. Um, I haven't included slides about specific species of willow because there are so many willows in the Pacific Northwest and um, there are a ton in Central Oregon, and they often actually hybridize when they're near each other. So they can be pretty tricky to tell apart, even if you've been studying plants your entire life. Um, so I'm just going to kind of generalize and talk about willows as a whole, as a genus. Um, so willows have really long, skinny leaves. Um, their bark can vary in color, the bark on the twigs. Um, Ethnobotanically, they, um, the bark of the willow is medicinal. Um, it's historically been used for headaches and it's actually components that are found in willow bark have been used to synthesize aspirin. So it is a pain relieving plant. Um, here's a great shot of the flowers of a willow. Um, one of the really notable features about them also is their bright, often yellow color. So you can spot a willow or group of willows from miles away in the flatlands. And you can you can tell exactly where water is. If there's willow, bright yellow willow shoots coming out and you're miles and miles away from where you thought water is, now you know where water is because they're a great indicator for that. Um, and this is uh, area a little bit east of Bend um, last winter. So they won't get their leaves until mid spring or so. Uh, a lot of them have already gotten a little bit of leafing out at this time of year, but not yet fully. All right, now we're moving up into the mountains. So this is a Western white pine. Um, they are a mid to higher elevation species typically. Um, when I'm going west in Deschutes County, I'll start seeing them kind of as I get closer and closer to Santium Pass. Um, this one is actually on St. Helens, uh, and it's up in the open on a volcano. So they, like lodgepole, will often grow higher up um, on those volcanic soils. They're pretty hardy. Uh, their needles are in bundles of five. You can't really tell from this picture, but that is the same for Western white pine and a very similar species called white bark pine. They can be found in similar ecosystems, um, but those bundles of five needles are a distinguisher for them. Along with that, they have these really long, lovely cones um, and sort of grayish bark. Um, the Western white pine, which I mentioned is quite similar, can be found in similar ecosystems. It's slightly more rare and it's more specialized and it actually has creatures like grizzly bear and Clark's nutcrackers that are specialists on those cones because it's really hard to break the seeds out but they have a special way of getting them out as a food source. So that's another cool plant you might see with western white pine and lodgepole up high in the mountains. All right, Douglas fir. Um, so the Douglas fir is not a fir, actually. <laughs> it's not a true fir. Um, so 
we call it Douglas fir because it looks like a fir tree and there's nothing wrong with that, but it is actually technically a pine tree. It's in the pine genus, or sorry, pine family. Um, you will see it in the mountains. It's kind of like a chameleon of plants. I've seen it on the coast, I've seen it in the mountains, it's in cities, it's kind of all over. It's not in the sagebrush steppe, but you'll see it in the mountains in central Oregon. Um, other than these lovely fresh green lemony buds that come out of it in the springtime, a really great identifier for the Douglas fir is this cone. So if you don't see the cone in the tree, it's probably on the ground somewhere nearby. If you're not sure what tree it is, it's a very distinct cone because it has these little, what I, I call them tassels, but they're a, a variation on a different type of scale. So they're the regular scales, but then they have these little um, subscales that come out of it. And some people say it looks like it has two little legs and a tail, like a mouse butt that comes out of it. Uh, it's a really distinct feature of the Doug fur. Um, there's a story that goes with the mouse tails, but I will save that for another time, or maybe you can look it up. <laughs> uh, Doug fur is really well adapted also to fiery ecosystems. Um, this on the right side of my screen, the sun is shining on really deeply furrowed, heavily layered Douglas fir bark. Um, and that is an adaptation so that if a forest fire were near a Douglas fir, the bark would slough off as it burns in order to pre protect the inner part of the plant, that cambium um, that carries all the nutrients through the plant is what it's aiming to protect. Here's another great shot of that. This is moving towards Eugene, but still kind of on the east side of the mountains. You'll start to see a ton of Douglas fir. All right, the vine maple. So vine maple is unlike most maples in that it doesn't grow straight up and allocate its limbs to the top of the tree. It is very much like a vine and it creeps out to the sides in the way it grows. Um, this red thing is the vine maple and this is the brilliant color it takes on in the fall. Um, here, you can see hidden back here is the summery green leaves of the vine maple as well. Um, you can identify them. They have really distinctive green bark um, and they also have branches that are relatively small in circumference, um, but they're really, really strong. They're very difficult to break. Um, historically um, and traditionally that has been, they have been really important for making things that you need to be nimble, but also very strong, like snowshoes, for instance, um, also has been used as a wood for making bows. Here's the leaf. Um, Another distinct feature of vine maple. So the name vine maple has nine letters in it. And you can remember the way the vine maple leaf is by the number of lobes the leaf has. So the lobes are these, each of these little round serrated edges. And if you were to start all the way at the very base, this tiny one, and then move all the way around, you would count nine lobes um, in the vine maple leaf. So that's just a fun, way to remember how to identify vine maple versus something like Douglas maple, which is sometimes growing in similar ecosystems, but the leaf looks quite different. All right, just a few more trees here. The Douglas, sorry, the grand fir. <laughs> uh, grand fir is really notable by having really flatly growing leaves um, and they're really glabrous so they're shiny um, and it is also a great one of those id by smell plants because it is one of the best smelling plants in the woods uh, often used as a christmas tree you will see these also as you move up into the mountains um, getting the ponderosas will start thinning and you'll start seeing more Douglas fir, you'll start seeing more grand fir, and you'll start seeing more things like vine maple mixed in. Um, you'll see these as well. Um, 
they're true fir. So unlike that Douglas fir that I mentioned, which is actually a pine, um, the, the grand fir is a true fir. And the way you can tell a true fir is most obviously by the cones. So the cones are very unique. Um, they have kind of wide, flat, winged scales. And they're a favorite of squirrels. They also grow kind of on the top of the branch rather than hanging below the branch. Um, sometimes you'll see them like little columns all sticking up in a row together. And they're also usually very sappy and smell wonderful. Here you can see that gray bark up on the grand fir tree when it's a little bit more mature. All right, saved the best for last. This is the Western larch tree. So Western larch are one of my favorite because they're so unique. They are coniferous, so they have cones um, and they have needles uh, as an ad adaptation for leaves, but they change colors and they lose their leaves in the fall and winter time. So this is that beautiful yellow fall larch color. Here's those leaf bundles close up. You can really tell the larch tree just by the individual twig and the leaves because all of the needles come out of uh, individual nodes. So you can kind of see it in this photo, but this photo, you can really see those nodes really well. Um, there'll be a spray of needles coming out of each individual node. Um, and then when they all fall off, you can tell the larch by the nodes because it's one of the few conifers that has those really distinct bumps all along the twig. Also, um, if you are a 90s kid, uh, if you touch the branch of the larch tree and you feel those wonderful needles, it feels really soft and somewhat similar to that toy called a kush ball. Um, really, really, really soft leaves. Uh, all right, so this is that fresh spring needle growth, um, the leaves coming back in in the springtime on the larch trees. Um, filling back in. All right, that's all the trees I have for y'all today. I guess we'll probably take questions in a minute. I'll just leave, the, these are just a few books that I like um, for trees and other plants around the area. Um, but yeah, if y'all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, thanks so much, Silky. That's awesome. You know, I've learned a lot, a couple of things about trees. You know, I've seen a lot of these on land trust preserves. We chose a few that we knew were out there on some of those locations and. No matter how many times I run up to and smell a ponderosa, I still enjoy it. So I hope <laughs> folks are able to really take your recommendations for all these good <laughs> smells. Um, I do have a few questions coming in, but I wanna give folks a little bit more time to type in their questions. You can type them in the comments or in the question and answer function. Um, then of course, if you enjoyed the presentation, again, consider a donation to the land trust to help protect and care for the lands that many of these trees grow on. So thank you in advance for, for your support. Um, there is, while we're looking at a photo of some larch, a question from Catherine about kind of where you can find larch. What zone are we, are we looking at? Um, I know, Catherine, I'll jump in. There are some larch that you can find at the Metolius Preserve. Um, but I'm sure Chelsea, you've got some other specifics. Uh, yeah, so the Western larch, there's a, a few different larch trees in the Northwest. The one we have here is the Western larch and it specializes in kind of volcanic soils. Um, it's at higher elevations and um, I actually don't see it in huge abundance in this area, but like Rebecca mentioned that Metolius Preserve, that area is gonna have a smattering of larch trees. So I've seen this picture actually is taken in a controlled burn area a couple of years ago near Camp Sherman. So on the road to Camp Sherman. Um, and also as you're going west towards Subtle Lake, um, there are there are larch trees kind of spread throughout the, the woods there. That's where I've seen the most of them anyway, in this area. 
Thanks. Yeah, it looks like Claire, Andy, Bonnie, you've all visited the same large grove at Shevlin Park. Jody too. So um, if you don't want to make the trek out to Camp Sherman, sounds like check out Shevlin Park. Cool. Good town. to know. Good to know. Yes. Um, so another question, it looks like, could you describe the differences between different kinds of juniper? Doesn't Central Oregon have different kinds of juniper trees? Hmm. Hmm. That is something I'm not super well versed in. Uh, Western juniper, I know there's something called Rocky Mountain juniper. I'm sure they intermingle uh, in this area, just the north of the Great Basin area, there's kind of like an ecosystem divergence. I do not know the specifics on how to ID the differences in them. I know uh, as far as my background in ethnobotany, ethnobotany goes botanically, they all have very similar constituents. So that's what I'm usually concerned with. But yeah, I, I don't know the identifying features between the two other than that they typically occupy different eco zones. Thanks. Yeah, we can, Karen, we can look up a specific answer for you too. I'm sure there's plenty out there to help with some ID. Um, another ID question, Christy wants to know, are tamarack and western larch the same tree? Are people mm. calling them different things? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, it's kind of the difficulty with common names, as some of you might know, uh, people use them interchangeably. And the only way to know really which one people are talking about is that the genus and species name. Um, and even then, who knows, they're similar. So it's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, here we have the Western March. Um, I know people call them tamaracks all the time. I think of tamaracks as being a species that lives typically in the Great Lakes area, uh, northern Minnesota, um, sort of central North America. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different species that's called tamarack. But here is western larch. Further north into Washington, you have alpine larch high up in the mountains there. Thanks. Yeah. Those common names will get me every time. I think that's what, what keeps me confused for most of my days. Yeah. I've got a question from Barbara, kind of taking us back to an earlier tree, wondering if you could just talk a little bit more or reiterate um, why the Siberian elm might have been in introduced in the area. The only thing I know about that is that it was introduced to a lot of towns in the southwestern United States as a, as a shade tree, um, because in places like New Mexico, there are a lot of towns where there are Siberian elms everywhere, and they were planted on purpose because it was one of the only trees that was hardy enough to grow and produce a lot of shade. Um, and so kind of the battle down there is, is the cost of having the invasiveness and the water table lowering and all of that. Um, what's the trade-off? <laughs> it's a nice shade tree down there and it's one of the only ones in many towns. So I think it was introduced as a shade, shade tree, although I am not certain. Yeah, great. Um, I've got more questions rolling in, so I'm just gonna keep us rolling forward. <laughs> um, we have a question about black cottonwood, the cottonwood, and where, what kind of zones where you might find or see cottonwood? Um, you'll see cottonwood in riparian, so really wet areas uh, along streams or along lakes or rivers. Um, I've seen cottonwood in Shedland Park. Uh, I see a cultivated variety of a poplar that somewhat resembles cottonwood in a lot of parks around town in Bend. Um, they're usually just referred to as poplar trees, but they look similar. They're a little bit different from the black native cottonwood. Um, but yeah, they like wet areas uh, and they're not super high elevation species. So usually low, low areas, farmland, things like that. Thanks. I, I think, uh, you know, my memory is not the best these days, but I'm pretty sure one of the photos of the cottonwood 
um, is from the Camp Polk Meadow Preserve out in Sister. So there, I think you can see them if you're heading out there. Um, yeah, one that of, riparian one of those, area along the creek. Yeah, one of those is also keep taken at one of the lakes by Camp Tamarack. So there's there's cottonwoods even up on the lakes, kind of mid elevation up there. Thank you. It sounds like everyone's out on tree hunts now, which is a good time to do because things are, you know, just starting to leaf out. So right now, give yourself your your pine tree hunt and then give it a couple of weeks and go out to get your vine maples and a uh, little later for your larch. Um, sounds like Barbara's seeing a huge grove of cottonwood um, near Steen. So if folks are wanting to go for a trip. Uh, there's another question here about Jean. I'm wondering if you're seeing any change in tree species um, kind of over the Cascade Crest. And, and that might be a question that's a little bit bigger, but do you have any any answer, a shorter answer of that? Oh, uh, you mean just species that you'll start seeing as you crest the Cascades and go like down onto the west side? I'm not sure, but sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, moving up into the mountains uh, on this side of the crest, you'll see more um, the grand fir, the dug fir, vine maple. Um, once you cross the west side, you'll see a lot more of the western red cedar. Or actually, before you get over there, you'll see a lot of uh, a few incense cedar, which is a different species of cedar that I didn't talk about, but it's a really cool one. Um, but yeah, over on the west side, you'll see big leaf maple, which um, is pretty prolific over there. Um, yeah, western red cedar, uh, mountain hemlock, and western hemlock too, as you move over there. Thanks. And Bonnie, I think that answers your question about hemlock. It's generally a little bit further on the west, but there's a chance you might see it. Um, in yeah, I, I have seen mountain hemlock um, on the hike up the South Sister, uh, not high up, but in that denser forest area. I've seen it. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think I'll give us one more question and we'll just wrap up. Um, the last question is about uh, trees and climate change and forest fires. And you mentioned a lot about the different adaptations that certain trees have. So the question here is, what are trees going to do in climate change, which is a huge question. Um, but do you want to share anything on that? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I can tell you some of my observations just living out west for the past decade or so. Changes I've seen is um, I've seen Douglas fir and Western red cedar straight up just turning brown and slowly dying as a result of, I think, more sun exposure and warmer, warmer climate. Um, and I think that trend will continue to move up northern more into the mountains. That's just what I've seen and what I've heard some experts talk about. Um, so I think a shift of more typically southerly species moving slowly northward um, as a whole. Uh, I think on a smaller scale, trees are super resilient. Like there are so many adaptations to fire and heat that are completely necessary for trees to thrive. So uh, like lodgepole um, has a cone that is serotonous, meaning it will only open with heat. Uh, and ponderosa has the ability to lose its lower branches as an adaptation to fire and to allocate allocate its energy up high. Um, they also can survive a forest fire with up to 80% of the tree except for the crown burnt, which is pretty awesome. Um, I think they're super resilient, but I've also definitely in my short time here on earth seen shifts um, that are trending further and further north. Yeah, as, as the climate changes, you know, these things are shifts. Right, not not these big changes that yeah. like, oh, all of these are gonna die, but the things change. Thank you so yeah. much for that great answer and all the other answers and sharing about some of these wonderful trees in our area. I think it sounds like people are excited to go smell and look at and um, try their hand at identifying a few more trees. So I hope folks That's are great. able to get out. Um, I know that you have a plant walk scheduled with the land trust on our schedule so folks can 
um, join that if they're interested in learning more with Chelsea about plants. But I'm sure you have other things going on um, that folks can get involved with and those books you mentioned. So anything, any last words or invitations for folks before we sign off? Uh, yeah, so I think in May, right, I'm doing the Skull Talk, the, the virtual Skull Talk, so I'm excited for that. In June, I'll do that walk at Waichus, and um, I also am an environmental educator here in town. I own a small business called Nighthawk Naturalist School. If people are interested in taking educational wilderness skills classes, uh, my website is just the name of the school.com, nighthawknaturalistschool.com. So, yeah, excited to see y'all hopefully at a future walk or event. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we'll see you again, either online or on a trail sometime soon. So have a great night. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, thanks. Bye everybody.